C'est avec uh, grand plaisir que nous invitons Doyen Lucie Thibault, uh, who is a professor and dean of the Faculty of Health Sciences here at the University of Ottawa, to give us an exciting update of the faculty, along with her senior leadership team, Dr. Marie Tax, who is vice dean of research, and Dr. Linda Garcia, who is the director of the Life Research Institute. I had a chance to meet with Dean Thibault a couple years earlier uh, when she was just starting, but in the midst of putting together a strategic plan for the faculty. And so this is a particularly well-timed opportunity for us to forge further collaborative research and partnership programs between the University of Ottawa Heart Institute and the Faculty of Health Sciences. First, I will say a few words about uh, Dean Thibault, and uh, then she will do the honors of introducing her leadership team with us today. Doyenne Lucie Thibault is a native of Ottawa, and she studied physical education at the University of Ottawa and later taught for five years in what is now the School of Human Kinetics. An internship at Swimming Canada in her fourth year inspired her to, to pursue graduate studies, which she completed at the University of Alberta. Subsequently, scholarly work and academic career took her to the University of British Columbia and subsequently Brock University. She was also a visiting scholar in Germany, teaching at the Eberhard Karls Universität in Tübingen and also the Reiner campus of the Koblenz University at the of Applied Sciences, uh, apologies. At uh, these institutions, she has taught organizational theory, ethics in sport, globalization of sport, governance and policy and social issues in sport. She also advises our Canadian government in various sports policies. She garnered global recognition for her work. She serves on the editorial board of the International Journal of Sports Policy and politics. She is a member of the North American Society of Sports Management, NASM, was named a NASM Research Fellow in 2001. And in 2008, Doyen Thibault was awarded the Earl Ziegler Award from NASM for her scholarly and leadership contribution to the field. Dean Thibault leads the Faculty of Health Sciences, which consists of five schools, including interdisciplinary health, nursing, nutritional sciences, rehabilitation sciences, and human kinetics. Of course, our Heart Institute community interacts very broadly with these um, domains and the investigators on a regular basis. So it's particularly exciting for us to hear the new directions for the faculty and explore opportunities for collaboration. We really look forward to Dean Thibault's presentation and thank her for honoring us with her team today. Thank you, Lucy. Thanks, Peter. Uh, and uh, I don't know if I, I want to start sharing my screen now. I will. Um, I will speak to my. You know, I will introduce my two uh, colleagues because they're also part of the presentation. So I can perhaps. Uh, I will share the screen. Um, let me do this. Uh, see if that works. I'll put it in the, uh, let me just go and get this out of there. Yeah, we can see, yeah, put on a screen show, it'll be perfect, beautiful. So you've got it as a screen, as a, okay, the slideshow, perfect. Okay, so thanks, Peter. And uh, first I wanted to thank Peter and Kelsey Bolger for the invitation and for organizing the presentation today. It's, it really is a pleasure for my colleagues and I to present some of the features of the Faculty of Health Sciences. Um, I also wanted to thank my co-presenters and introduce them. Uh, I'll start with Professor Marike Tax. Uh, she is the new VD research for the faculty and she's been in the position since July uh, 2020. Not, not too easy to start a, a new position of leadership uh, during the COVID times. Uh, Mareike replaced Jeff Jutai uh, in the research leadership position. Mareike is a full professor in the School of Human Kinetics, specializing in sport management and in the socioeconomic aspects of sports in society. 
Mareike started working at the University of Ottawa in 2016. She came to us from the University of Windsor and also from KU Leuven in Belgium, where she has maintained her connections there. Mareike will speak to the features of the faculty's research priorities in part two of the presentation. Many of you already know Professor Linda Garcia. She has been at the University of Ottawa and in the faculty, I think for the last 28 years, if I, my calculator worked out well. Uh, she helped create the speech language pathology program in the School of Rehab Sciences. Linda has held multiple leadership roles uh, within the faculty over the course of her career. She helped create the Interdisciplinary School of Health Sciences and became its founding director and subsequently held the role of Vice Dean Governance for the faculty. And in 2018, she successfully created and launched the Life Research Institute with the Office of the Vice President Research here at the, uh, at the university and became its founding director. Linda will speak about the Life Research Institute in part three of this presentation. So let me start with the uh, presentation now. Okay, let's see if this works. So the vision of the faculty um, is to, we are committed to becoming a nationally and internationally recognized uh, leader in innovative approaches to active living, health promotion, quality health care and health services. And as Peter has mentioned, uh, the faculty is composed of five schools. So the Interdisciplinary School of Health Sciences, Human Kinetics, Nursing, Nutrition Sciences, and Rehab Sciences. In these academic programs, we have uh, approximately 31 programs at the undergraduate level and 36 programs at the graduate level. And I am counting the specializations, I am counting diplomas, I'm counting minors, and I'm counting uh, the actual degrees. Um, we have nearly 4,900 students. Um, we have increased the number of students uh, over the course of the last few years. Uh, and we've had successful recruitment campaigns to try to attract as many students as possible and to continue the mission of the university to offer programs en français as well as programs uh, in English. And so you can see the numbers, so nearly 800 students at the graduate level, uh, nearly 4,100 students at the undergraduate level. We also have a number of our programs that are accredited. Um, a professional, so the point of this uh, slide is really to highlight the fact that uh, the faculty has a number of professional schools and, and professional programs. And so we are in a constant uh, reevaluation and, and, uh, and, and um, improvement of our programs to meet the requirements for accreditation. Uh, from these various different schools. We also try as best as we can to promote interprofessional uh, activities between all of these um, uh, programs and some of the other schools in our uh, faculty as well. Um, we are located on the three main campuses or three campuses of, of the university. And actually, I believe we are the only faculty that's, uh, that uh, functions out of the three campuses. So the main campus, I've uh, used Montpetit as the, uh, as the photo in the slide. Uh, Montpetit is the location for uh, the School of Human Kinetics, but on the main campus, we also uh, currently have the School of Nutrition Sciences, as well as uh, Interdisciplinary Health Sciences uh, located there. Um, we have at the Alta Vista campus, which is often referred to as RGN or Roger Guindon, uh, which I'm assuming you're very familiar with, is um, a building we share with the Faculty of Medicine, and that is where the School of Rehab Sciences and the School of Nursing are uh, located. And uh, in this uh, corner, we have uh, 200 Lees which uh, is about to be renamed the Rideau River Campus 
Um, so uh, it's the location of our sim lab for nursing. It's also our teaching lab, our, our newest addition, a teaching lab in nutrition is located in, in one of the blocks on the property, as well as a number of researchers have their spaces at uh, 200 Lees. Uh, so it's an uh, important um, a site for our faculty. I'll come back to the Rideau River campus in a, in a moment. Um, with respect to the size and scope of our faculty, just to give you an idea, we have 118 professors and nearly 100 administrative personnel that help us uh, reach our mandate as a faculty. And more importantly, in our, um, uh, within the faculty, we have created a, um, a strategic plan and essentially identified four strategic imperatives. Uh, excellence is focused on promoting and enhancing teaching, learning and research quality and impact. Excellence is also focused on developing an approach that is centered on students and maintaining a positive work climate within the schools and the faculty. With respect to workspace, uh, we're focusing on, on creating a work environment that is conducive for positive exchanges among students, administrative personnel, part-time teaching personnel, as well as faculty members, where the faculty as a whole can thrive in teaching, research, and service to the community. And of course, being located on the three campuses has its challenges. And that's why space was considered to be an important uh, imperative to consider in our strategic plan. Innovation is focused on promoting innovative practices in teaching and learning, as well as in research undertaken by uh, faculty members. And communication is focused on enhancing our visibility within the university, but also beyond, and to showcase the work that we do in teaching research, as well as our service to the community. And uh, I have to say that within those four imperatives are interwoven the principles of equity, diversity, and inclusion. And in recent months, we have invested a lot more effort in, in trying to update uh, our curriculum uh, to address BIPOC issues in better preparing our students for their careers uh, in healthcare. And uh, in terms of the future of the faculty, I'm going to focus specifically on, on one area, uh, and that is the uh, in, in regards to space. And if you're familiar at all with the Faculty of Health Sciences, we have been looking for you know, a space that brings us together rather than sort of um, splits us up into various uh, uh, places on campus. With this new building, we will still uh, be located on the three campuses of the university, but we'll have a place for uh, our three professional schools, that is nursing, nutrition sciences, and rehab sciences. So for teaching spaces, as well as office space. And we'll also have um, uh, a number of uh, research labs from various schools that will be, cre that will be uh, created and located at this uh, Rideau River campus. Um, so top shelf uh, appears on the slide and that's the name of the capital projects, plural, which includes new buildings for the faculty, as well as important renovations at the Alta Vista campus so the Roger Guindon building, as well as a new research facility that you might be familiar with. It's, uh, it's called the Advanced Medical uh, Research Center. I'm hoping to add and help in that uh, center, but that's a new build that will go on the Alta Vista campus. Um, and we're in uh, the planning stage uh, with CHEO for that facility to go, uh, to go on that campus. So we will have space as well. We will share the space with the Faculty of Medicine. Um, and with Roger Guindon, that's where the location of our wet labs. And we will also be sharing, of course, the space with the Faculty of Medicine. And just a sort of another uh, view of the site. And when you drive on the Queensway, you often see the, the football field. So that is staying there. Um, we will be removing uh, three blocks. Uh, so blocks uh, C, which is the, the when you enter uh, 200 Lees, it's block C. 
Block B and Block D will be uh, demolished probably this summer. And the, the building in green will be the new footprint of, uh, of this uh, five floor uh, building that will include the classrooms as well as the research spaces and, and office space. And then Block E, which is the one that's closest to the Queensway will remain for the time being as well. Block A will remain as well. So um, I'm gonna stop there. Mareike is uh, talking about the research within the Faculty of Health Sciences. So let me, I'll stop the share uh, to allow Mareike to share. Your microphone may still be off, Mareike. All right, are we good? Can you see my screen? Yes. Uh, yes, excellent, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. So I will be speaking about uh, the research priorities uh, in our faculty. And of course, I would like to join Lucy to thanking uh, the University of Ottawa Heart Institute for inviting us. And as you will see from my talk, uh, developing partnerships and interdisciplinarity is high on our priority list. So I really appreciate uh, this invitation for that specific purpose. Um, so to talk a little bit, apologies, I need to change, okay. So to, to give you a little bit of background information about the research. Um, so we had last year about a little over 11 million external funding of which about 5 million was tri-council funding. And I have included two graphs in there to show that we're really tapping into the three councils, uh, which is uh, very unique. Um, so SHRC, NSERC, and CIHR. Um, it really shows the breadth of what we're doing in our faculty. And I often consider our faculty to be a mini university because we really go all the way from the biological sciences to the social and human sciences. So we have that whole scope in one faculty. And so the tri-council funding uh, really demonstrates that. But what you can see from these graphs is that um, CIHR uh, brings in the most amount of money followed by NSERC and SHRC. But when you look at the number of grants, we have uh, equal SHRC and NSER grants and a, a bit fewer CIHR grants, but regardless, they bring in uh, most money. With regard to funding from uh, agencies with a cardiovascular research focus, so uh, such as the uh, Heart and Stroke Foundation, uh, the past two years, we had about $200,000 uh, from, uh, the, from grants from that uh, area. So there is definitely room for growth. About 57% 57, uh, 57 professors have external funding and about 42% have uh, tri-council funding. We, uh, in our faculty, we have two Canada research chairs, seven university research chairs, two chairs de recherche de l'université sur la francophonie, two endowed chairs and five sponsored chairs. And a few of these uh, chairs actually do work that is already related with uh, cardiovascular research. So I would like to introduce you uh, a, a couple of these research chairs where we see um, a connection with uh, cardiovascular research. So for example, Glenn Kenny from the School of Human Kinetics, um, University Research Chair in Human Environmental Physiology. His expertise is in human thermoregulation as well as physical activity and health. And he particularly looks at heat stress in vulnerable populations, including older adults and individuals with chronic disease. Uh, Ian Brunel is from the Interdisciplinary School of Health Sciences, and he has a university research chair in integrative mitochondrial biology. And he examines mitochondrial dysfunctions or functions or dysfunctions in the context of skeletal muscles, but also cardiomyopathies and genetic mitochondrial diseases. Uh, Pascal Ambol from the School of Human Kinetics is a Montfort Research Chair in Physical and Mental uh, Comorbidities, 
and uh, he does cardiovascular metabolic work. So we see already direct connections here. In my next slide, I introduce a few uh, uh, of our colleagues who hold chairs and uh, where a potential connection with cardiovascular research is definitely possible. So for example, uh, Jennifer Brunette in the School of Human Kinetics um, is a CRC2 chair in physical activity and uh, promotion of cancer prevention and survivorship. Uh, what she applies is obviously also possible for um, heart and stroke patients. Giacent Savar, she, um, she is at um, the School of Rehabilitation and she is Chair de la Recherche sur la Francophonie. And she is a joint chair, uh, but she specifically focuses on accessing health services, barriers, facilitators for Francophone minorities. So this could be applied to heart and stroke patients uh, that belong to that minority group. Dan Stacy in the School of Nursing is a university research chair in knowledge translation to patients. And she has a very strong focus on patient engagement. And her work is mainly uh, with cancer patients. But one of her former PhD students, who is actually also currently a faculty member, uh, Krista Lewis, applies this approach specifically to, of patient engagement to, to the vascular field. Uh, Wendy Gifford from the School of Nursing has an endowed chair and she investigates how to incorporate indigenous ways into practice. And this can equally be applied to cardiovascular healthcare in those communities. Uh, the fifth one is Shibukwe Undengingwe from the School of uh, Nutrition Sciences. Uh, so his expertise, area of expertise is definitely in nutrition and he manipulates foods components like proteins to improve health. And that could of course also include cardiovascular health. So that is to already look for possible connections uh, with cardiovascular. What I'm gonna focus on is actually this, this figure and just consider it a figure for now because it really uh, presents the four strategic priorities which were actually developed under the leadership of the previous Vice Dean research, uh, but it's definitely the foundation uh, for our faculty. So what you see here is four main strategic pri priorities and I will focus on each of them in my next slides. Right now, I just would like you to, um, to focus your attention on the middle part because those are the, cut, the, the cross cutting themes across all, which includes interdisciplinarity, knowledge mobilization, translation and transfer, international collaboration, la francophonie and bilingualism and indigenous knowledge. So that is cross cutting themes. I will come back to these at the end but now I will focus into each of these uh, pillars. So the first pillar is addressing specific or distinct needs of communities of special interest. This includes addressing disparities in the health of marginal populations, francophone minority healthcare, which I've already talked about, health reconciliation and community capacity building with First Nations, Métis and Inuit people, improving performance for athletes, for military, quality of life as we age, sexual health and well-being. And to give you a few examples of, of colleagues working in this area, um, it includes contributing to a better understanding of the complex interplay of various determinants of inequities in health and healthcare, focusing on African, Caribbean, and Black communities, but also fr Francophone minorities. So Josephine Etoa is one of our colleagues who looks specifically into Black communities. Uh, another example would be informing health policies, educational programs, clinical practices to address systematic racism and inequities in healthcare that leads to poor health for Indigenous people in Canada. 
there we have work of Wendy Gifford, who I already previously introduced. Addressing food security, nutrition, health of marginal and vulnerable pregnant women uh, through a continuum of tailored and coordinated nutritional community and healthcare services. And there is work from Benedict Fontaine Bizot and Alex Dumas. So specific needs of communities and special interests. These needs may certainly be also cardiovascular related. The second uh, pillar is about enabling health, well-being and performance across the lifespan. And we will hear more about across the lifespan later, but I'm briefly going to touch upon what's being done in the faculty. So this includes brain activity and cognitive performance, uh, functional analysis of human motion, improving women's and reproductive health, promoting health, active living through diet and exercise, the role of sport in Canadian society, and supporting physical and mental wellness through healthy lifestyles. Uh, example of work in this area is, for instance, enhancing physical activity, engagement, participation, and adherence through adapted, personalized programs for various clinical and non-clinical populations. So work from Jennifer Brunet, which I previously already introduced on cancer patients, and is a clinical population, but it can definitely be applied to um, cardiovascular uh, patients. Similar work from Lara Piluti, Michael Delisio about physical activity engagement tailored to specific needs and Audrey Giles specifically to First Nations. Other examples in this uh, area of enabling health, well-being and performance um, is more related to um, identifying mechanisms that underlie abnormal placental development and function and they translate these findings into clinically useful tools aimed at improving pregnancy outcomes. Well, we all know that in prenatal uh, situations, there can be uh, heart issues uh, at hand. So Shannon Brainbridge and Christy Adamo are working in this area. Uh, the last uh, example I'm giving here is um, understanding the contribution of certain physiological and endocrine factors to obesity, including the effect of nutrition, eating behavior, and physical activity on energy balance. And examples is work from Eric Doucet, uh, Pascal Limbeau, and Krista Power. The third um, strategic research priority or the third pillar is related to human metabolism. Here it is about the adaptation of physical exertion and extreme environments. I already talked about the work from Glenn Kenny. Uh, diet and microbiome in health and disease, energy metabolism and the whole body and food composition, uh, digestion and health. Some examples here, uh, capturing the diversity and dynamics of mitochondrial dysfunctions in the context of, amongst other, uh, cardiomyopathies, so from Ian Burel. We have identifying novel genetic variants linking susceptibility to chronic high blood pressure, pressure dietary salt sensitivity, and cognitive impairment from Frédéric Tesson, for example. And then the third example here is determining the importance of various food components and dietary patterns. Uh, on intestinal health and intestinal associated diseases such as obesity, inflammatory bowel disease. Examples are Krista Power and Shibukwe Undegwe. That brings us to the fourth pillar, which is about improving the quality of life for those living with acute and chronic conditions across a uh, setting of care. Well, everything here could apply to patients with cardiovascular problems. Uh, assistive technologies for persons who have a disability, interprofessional collaborative care for effective service delivery, 
management and treatment of disability and chronic illness. Obviously, cardiovascular is part of that. Nutritional supports for people with diet-related illness, palliative care and end-of-life practices, rehabilitation and adaptation strategies for persons who have suffered injuries, and resilience in the face of environmental, social, psychological, and physical stressors. It is evident that each of those can be uh, linked to uh, heart and stroke. Uh, I have already introduced the work from Christina Lewis and Dan Stacy, which is really about finding innovative approaches to deliver collaborative, effective, and sustainable healthcare services that are inclusive of patient engagement preferences, and particularly older adults with cardiovascular disease. So lots of expertise in this realm that can be applied. Um, another example, work from Tracy O'Sullivan uh, on using community-based community participatory action uh, research uh, to enhance resilience and preparedness among high-risk populations, for instance, those who are recovering from a stroke, and, and using a functional capabilities framework. The last example here is uh, work from Heather Flowers and Anna Zumbansen, who developed a health tech app for communication access assessment after acute stroke. So with that, I've kind of um, given you some examples of work that is being done uh, within our faculty overall. What I quickly wanted to do next, and I know for the sake of time, um, there is not so much left, but I had uh, also kind of focused on what the five schools are doing in a nutshell. So I, I quickly will go over them so that um, I can give enough time for Linda to make her presentation. So there's connections in every school, interdisciplinary school of health sciences, we have integrative health biosciences, population health and social sciences and health technology research. In each of these areas, we can find uh, connections and colleagues who will um, contribute there. Uh, School of Human Kinetics, we have social cultural studies, leisure management, sport management, psychology and pedagogy of physical activity and sport biomechanics, motor control, learning, and physiology. Again, uh, social issues, social inequalities of physical activity and sport. In the psychology realm, it's how can we facilitate uh, certain behavioral outcomes uh, through physical activity to improve quality of life. We have people in motor control uh, that work about skilled movement in normal elderly and pato pathological populations. And same in physiology, I already uh, spoke about uh, the thermoregulation, for example. School of Nursing, obviously lots of connections there. Um, community health, decision-making processes and knowledge transfer. I already uh, talked about the expertise we have there. Palliative care and nursing for uh, minority populations. So lots of connections there, uh, evidence-based practices that can be applied to uh, heart and stroke patients. Uh, with regard to nutrition, uh, I see some connections there related to diet and development of chronic disease later in life. Uh, nutrogenomics, prebiotics and probiotics expertise, uh, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, all possibly linked and linked to heart and stroke. And that brings us to the School of Rehabilitation Sciences, uh, where we already talked about knowledge transfer, cognition of motor skills, social participation, but lots of work is done here with uh, heart and stroke patients or patients who suffered uh, a stroke. For the sake of time, I'm going to skip uh, this particular section, the cross-cutting themes research priorities, which kind of comes back of what we focused 
will be focusing on moving forward. I know we have a discussion coming after this, so I can bring it back there. Um, but I would like to end with um, the um, one of our priorities is to strengthen partnerships, interrelationships, interdisciplinarity. And one way to do that is to fostering uh, research centers and institutes. And so we are engaged with three institutes right now, um, Center for Research in Health and Nursing, Music and Health Research Institute just recently uh, put into place. And then one is the Life Research Institute. And with that, I'd like to give the floor to Linda. And I need to That's stop. Good. Thank sharing. you, Marika. Okay. Okay, can you all see that screen? We're good? Okay, yes, again, good. thank you. Yes, good, okay. Um, so thanks again, everyone, for this invitation. Absolutely thrilled about being here. Um, okay, if I could only, here we go. Okay, so aging for us begins before birth and it's really our response to the multitude of factors that influences, uh, that are, and the influences that are, are faced throughout all of our life trajectories. So, you know, we age when we start, when we're born basically, or even before. Um, so if we look at the Faculty of Health Sciences actually gave us birth. So if we're gonna use the lifespan uh, trajectory issue, we're still, we're still kids here. We're just starting out and we're, we're moving ahead as an institute. Um, the initial idea came from the Faculty of Health Sciences. We did uh, an external validation and scan across the country to see what can we be doing that would be a little bit different from some of the aging institutes. We talked to uh, a lot of people around the country and they said a couple of things to us. They said, one of them is we really need to start documenting change over time and we really need to focus on complexity. So, you know, just because you have a heart condition doesn't mean you don't have dementia, doesn't mean that you have, don't have arthritis or that you have financial issues or that, you know, all of these, uh, or you can't get to work. So all of these things, look at the complexity. We partnered with the International Longevity Center's Global Alliance. The International Longevity Center Canada is actually hooked up quite closely with the Life Research Institute. They have access to about 18 countries around the world. And actually tomorrow, if you're interested, they're at the UN pushing for a UN convention on the rights of older persons. So if anybody's interested on listening in for that, our ambassador to the UN will be part of that as well. Um, and then we did some internal validation to see whether, so the first few um, years, like in 2018 and so on, we were kind of going around and seeing if people were interested and we submitted the documents in 2018 and I got my first mandate in 2019. So I'm done in, uh, in 2023. Aging to us is not, a part of life, it actually is life. So what we want to do is to assemble researchers and partners with diverse perspectives, that complexity piece I was talking about before. And we, re we really need to work collaboratively to understand how we end up where we end up in later life. We expect that this will transform our views of what it is to age and the roles for individuals in society. So we are kind of pulling it out a little bit from that tra traditional looking of aging as a health issue, the physical aging, and looking at the whole experience as well. Uh, we want to inspire individuals to live the longest, best lives possible, honoring the choices they have along the way. So in order to do this, we formed three pillars, if you like, live long, live well, live with voice and choice. So you'll see on this slide and the next one, there's a bunch of names. What I would like to draw your attention to is the blue, which suggests the number of faculties or the, the faculties with which these members are associated. So if you look at our co-leads here, we have engineering and medicine, live well, we have health science and Telfer, and live with voice and choice, we have common law and arts. Likewise, when you look at our committees, we have an advisory committee that meets once a year, twice a year in the beginning. We have three deans sitting on this advisory committee. We have some experts in aging from around the world, including one from the AARP, which is an organization in the United States that has 33 million members. Uh, Madeleine Mea, which many of you might know, Chitra Nan, who's an advisor and an influencer with the private, uh, in the private sector. Our steering committee is the one that's actually making the decisions based on advice from our advisory committee, research and learning committees. 
The steering committee, again, if you go just eye through the blue here, you'll see the different faculties that are represented on our various committees. So we really are walking the talk or um, in terms of getting people involved from across the campus. Um, so again, in a research committee, we've got people from different faculties. And of course, as a research institute, uh, we have to have a learning piece to this, which uh, looks at learning in its traditional sense of courses and so on and looking at that, but also in terms of uh, knowledge trans uh, translation as well. Uh, in the little, in the past few years, we also developed a, a logo to brand us a bit. And I just three seconds to go through this, um, going from small to larger, from early childhood to later life with a focus in later life. Um, we've changed our word life into an acronym. We link people. We uh, look at the investigations themselves. We fuse and we educate. And I'll walk through uh, very quickly each of these different areas. So linking, what does that mean? Well, we just spend time trying to get people to get to know other people. So we'll try and have events and connections and so on. Uh, we had some forums with uh, where we focused on age-friendly healthcare and age-friendly air travel, which is taken off, no pun intended, um, to, uh, to move forward on, on these issues as well. Um, and we've had some major events and we've hooked up with uh, some people in Krakow, Hong Kong, Linz and Austria and Saint Etienne in France, where we invited 18 researchers to start looking at something that we've termed connected autonomy. Um, then we looked at, we, the I stands for investigate. So looking at the actual research projects and what we can do to help uh, fund that going from epigenetics to ageism, again, very reflective of the Faculty of Health Sciences, but also pulling in other faculties to help us look at things like ageism and understand uh, how that impacts uh, people's lives as they live long. So improving individuals' life expectancy, live well, the quality of life, using all the biopsychosocial factors that contribute to well-being, and changing our perceptions of what we mean by voice and who actually has a choice. Fusion. Fusion means linking is not enough. That's what it means. It means you can't just put two people together and expect they're gonna produce something together. So we're pushing to try to look at how we connect individuals together to stimulate co-creation. We're very interested in knowing what added value the Life Research Institute can bring to your research. So we look at um, always pulling on different faculties. So one of the things we wanna do is bring faculties together on different projects so, um, so far in the last year, we've had projects funded by industry on aging technology and the experiences of home, a novel social nutrition approach to decrease maternal and infant health. I think Marika already spoke to that and understanding health and well-being from an indigenous disability perspective. And the PI on this study is actually from the Faculty of Education. So we do have PIs who are from other uh, faculties as well. Um, we've um, written lots of chapters during COVID. We were just chatting about this before, um, before the webinar. And then some grants around caregiving, um, submitted grants around housing and surveillance of community dwelling uh, persons with dementia and caregiver dyads. And multiple uh, presentations. And again, trying to pull in people from different faculties. On the education side, doing it as well. Uh, trying to pull people, student involvement on a multi-faculty presentations, looking at generational imp impact of on housing and technology. Again, pulling people from students from Telfer, working with students from the social sciences and students from health, working with people in economics and so on. Um, and looking at, uh, we're now in the process of looking at creating an intergenerational curricula through the microcredits program. Uh, we've helped kickstart a student group with an interest on aging. And we're working uh, with the uh, ILC Canada, as I mentioned, to push for a UN convention on the rights of older persons and starting to build some scholarships as well. So right now we have 118 members already across the, uh, the campus and, and uh, some outside members as well. 79 of these are, are, have uh, identified themselves as principal or affiliated researchers. So that means they were, are willing to um, take on studies but you'll, um, on their own, like either lead them or be affiliated with, with others. 
Um, our, we also have a researcher clinicians when we're interested in, in community members becoming members, as well as groups can become members of the Institute as well. So the goals for our coming year, as I said, we tried to establish the governance up until now, and now we really want to engage this membership. So we are working towards uh, developing research groupings. We've interviewed uh, most of those members, those 79 members, the academic ones, because what we wanted to know is to find out what's your dream? Where do you want to be? What do you want to solve? How do you want to land there? And, um, and then trying to look at bringing people together across the Institute. A lot of people have told us that's really what they want is to get to know people in disciplines that they wouldn't think of um, in terms of associating with, with their research. Um, looking at follow-up uh, linkages. So we've actually working with some people in engineering to develop indicators of added value. So for instance, if we put two researchers together, we will follow and see what happened to that. Did you apply for a grant? Did you publish something together? And we're trying to get this. Um, uh, and if we have events, the same kind of story. And we're working on uh, faculty investment. We're very honored to say that we have some funding from the Faculty of Health Sciences, of course, who's been super generous with us, the Faculty of Social Sciences, Engineering, the School of Management, and the Faculty of Arts. So we're very pleased to see that, um, you know, it, it really is a, a pan-university um, institute. Um, our group looking, just building a little bit on, on COVID, trying to figure out COVID basically helped us see some of the, the cracks in the system. So we, we tried to see what could we possibly look at in the next five years, knowing we go from epigenetics to, to ageism and across 10 faculties. And the ones, this isn't set in stone yet, but the blue ones are what you see are our are, are research kind of strategies for right now. Uh, we're looking at how we can take care of ourselves and others. I think there's be a lot of collab potential collaboration there, of course. What are our vulnerabilities to living well? And how can we listen to the voices of others? And on the education and learning side, we want to change the perceptions of aging. We want to learn, uh, help people learn how to work with older adults, as well as um, learning to make our research known. We were talking about this a little before the webinar about how researchers are a little reticent to get out there and have their research known and want to help our, our members get there as well. What you're seeing in the dotted white lines are some of the groupings we're already thinking about. So as you can see, they're not disease-based. So you can have problems in employment uh, because of cardiac problems or dementia, or you have no money or you know all different kinds of things. So how looking at these life trajectories and bringing all this together, bringing those researchers together. Um, and one thing that we did is we asked our basic and clinical scientists, because we have some members from the Heart Institute and we have some members from OHRI and Bruyere and so on. And these are of course our institutes that are much more established than the Life Research Institute. So we asked them, you know, during these interviews, why are you a member? Why would you want to be a member? And what can we do for you? Um, and so our basic and clinical scientists, all of them, regardless of where they were, are basically looking at stopping or slowing down a disease process. And they were uh, looking for engaged patients and making relevance uh, of their research. So if I'm working on stem cell research, why would that, how can we help the general public understand the value of that when we put it in an interdisciplinary context. The same with dealing with the real whole person, really a, um, a big um, push for those researchers is to help wanting us to connect them with uh, some community groups and so on. And, and developing some unusual connections. We had conversations about, for instance, people in the Faculty of Arts and how they can use visual arts and theater and so on to try to portray some of the the things that are going on in the basic and clinical scientists to make it uh, more accessible to people out there. So I guess that's the end for me. And I guess I'll ask you the same things. How can we help you and how can we collaborate? Thank you very much for the invitation. Yeah, so thanks so much. Uh, Maxi Buku, this is really uh, outstanding and uh, certainly a lot of uh, uh, new information and uh, you know sort of uh, uh, very very exciting and uh, 
Um, and I wonder if we uh, can uh, entertain uh, some uh, uh, questions as well. And uh, uh, but uh, I think uh, you know. So I, uh, maybe I just uh, uh, give a little perspective. You know, from the cardiovascular side. You know, so there's no question that uh, uh, cardiovascular disease. You know, still the number one killer uh, worldwide. And uh, our you know cardiac patients end up uh, here. But at the same time. We know that uh, you know the heart uh, is not just you know sometimes people think that we just focus on the heart, but think of the you know the dementia, the vascular disease is you know related to cardiovascular disease, and uh, you know so uh, we need to be experts in endocrinology, nephrology, pulmonology, you know so everything that we look after because our patients really you know has all these comorbidities and uh, heart I guess uh, pumps the blood to every organ in the body. And uh, so, you know, it's really actually the whole patient approach and that we, of course, you know, um, apply precision medicine. But I was really surprised that as a number of areas that's actually overlap, you know, in terms of your presentation. Uh, but I guess it's a little bit regrettable for me that I would like to see, in fact, our investigators, you know, kind of uh, totally populate your, you know, sort of uh, domains. Uh, but uh, uh, I see that uh, the cancer folks and uh, uh, stroke folks have, uh, you know, sort of uh, somehow uh, you know, beat us to the finishing line. So I'd like to certainly, you know, sort of uh, get uh, our, you know, investigators uh, much involved. You know, so, so many of them work on uh, aging, you know, senescence in the immune system, you know, major grants uh, in these areas. And of course, all the conditions we look after, whether that's a heart failure, that's atherosclerosis, arrhythmias, you know, all these, uh, you know, not surprisingly, they are all age related. And you know we're trying to find solutions as well. Yeah, so it's really actually so many areas of collaboration. You know, so so natural. So this is a, a great uh, opportunity for lots of uh, I think cross talk and the really you know sort of enhancing those uh, uh, um, you know impact mutual impact. Yeah. So maybe I can entertain some questions. So question here. And uh, uh, where do you perceive being the challenges for collaboration? And, uh, and uh, you know, how do we engage our scientists and the faculty going forward? Of course, you know, so we're going to actually discuss this in our kind of round table. But I think, uh, you know, so this is uh, something I think uh, is uh, certainly, um, I guess, perceived by the audience. And so maybe we could actually, you know, sort of explore you know, uh, so how, how do we, you know, open more doors and windows and uh, so that uh, uh, we can be, you know, sort of a, a one big family, so to speak. Yeah, and I, I like I, I can start, but uh, if Linda and Marika want to step in, and I have to say I apologize for my computer decided to do an update. Uh, <laughs> so I, I missed a little part of, of Marika's presentation, but was able to join on my phone and then transfer uh, during Linda's presentation. So apologies for the disruption, but uh, Thank you for the question. I, I think collaboration is really important. I think, uh, you know, sort of open lines of communication is probably the first step. Um, I think we, we I, I, I know we have a lot of commonalities in terms of points. And I, I know that there's already a lot of collaboration that, that takes place between our researchers, uh, you know, within the faculty, within the University of Ottawa, and also with, with research institutes at TOH, at CHIO, at Bruyère, at Montfort. So, uh, so I think we're perhaps not as prominent in the Heart Institute, but I think it would be great uh, to be uh, more prominent. And I think part of it is, is for, for us to find out what you do and, and for you to find out what we do. And, and I think that could create the synergies to, uh, to proceed. Et puis je vais laisser Marika ou uh, Linda if you wanted to add something. I, I, I cannot speak to barriers in the past, uh, so I don't know about the past. Uh, what, what I do notice moving forward to create um, partnerships and collaborations, it, it works best if it comes bottom up from the researchers. If the researchers find each other in a project that that usually is the best way. So it's going to be a matter of, of communicating about opportunities, creating opportunities for researchers to connect and let it come from bottom up. 
Peter, the only other thing I would add, I think, is, is the fact that we have a tendency as researchers to look at what we're doing now and focus on that. And I think one of the things we've been finding it's helpful is to think about where your researchers, you know, what world problems they want, at least for the Life Research Institute, for us, it would be interesting to hear from your researchers about what problem are you trying to solve? You know, like not only in the, in the vascular system, but what would you, if you had, you know, if you won a Nobel Prize, what would it be on? Or what would be your legacy? And that helps us know where you want to go and then start looking at those connections as well as mentioned to try to see, okay, well, you know, did you know about this person? Because this person can maybe do help you get there. I think that's, um, you know, looking at what's possible down the road and not always just how we can help our research now. And, and I think what you suggest ties nicely into the second question I see there, uh, where, they, where they see a problem. Eh? How can we increase awareness about the importance of healthy lifestyles in clinical settings, such as the Heart Institute among both staff and patients? We have that expertise in house. So if, if we know that this is a question that is important for you, then that is a question we can ask our researchers whether, she would, whether they would be willing to embark. Um, so that ties in into what Linda suggests that, that, that we find each other and what questions are you asking? Right, yeah, absolutely. You know, so we have, uh, you know, sort of uh, research with uh, indigenous population, you know, because we actually look after a number of these patients and, uh, you know, we have studies in health equity, we map the Ontario you know, sort of a different uh, population's outcome, and we mapped it to COVID exposure, you know, so lots of things, you know, that's really, you know, perfect aligned. So it's really a win-win scenario uh, for sure. Mm -hmm. um, there's another question that is that, uh, uh, you know, um, your faculty deal with a lot of themes that uh, really is uh, top of mind for the public and uh, for the uh, media. And, uh, you know, things like uh, nutrition, healthy living and uh, aging, obviously. And uh, so uh, how do we, uh, you know, make sure that we can get uh, the, you know, of course we deal with a lot of that, uh, you know, uh, as well. And so the question is, you know, how do we kind of uh, synchronize our message? You know, we talked about earlier, you know, sort of based on as much uh, of the scientific, you know, insight that we have. And so that the public, you know, sort of uh, don't get confused and that they get, uh, you know, sort of to trust science and actually, you know, apply the science to their own, you know, sort of uh, lives as well. Yeah, and I'm actually working with the School of Nutrition Sciences because they, we, we just opened their teaching lab uh, back in January without any students, but uh, hopefully that, uh, that changes as uh, we start to bring back students in the fall and uh, looking at using the labs, not only for teaching our students, but also for bringing uh, people in and teaching them about uh, healthy uh, nutrition. Uh, you know, if they're suffering from diabetes, from high cholesterol, uh, if they're recuperating after, um, after a, a heart incident and or cardiac incident. And I think, uh, you know, there's, uh, there are ways for us to reach the public by um, by uh, educating them and and contributing to that, we're also looking at the development of um, a, a camps, summer camps uh, for teenagers uh, to actually teach them about nutrition as a way to again to educate a younger population and the impact of what you choose to eat and and the impact that it has on long term health. And so I, I think, you know, Allison, you're right in, in asking your question. I think we have a lot of, uh, of work to do to make sure that uh, the experts are actually the ones that, uh, that provide the information to the public and dispel some of that, uh, you know, fake news or misinformation that, uh, that seems to be out there. Yeah, and, uh, so some of them, you know, some of our teams I know have a work together with the Heart and Stroke Foundation and actually have a very uh, uh, well, um, I guess, uh, structured uh, school programs, you know, in which the mm -hmm. students are engaged on, you know, make sure not no smoking and the things like that, but also in terms of nutrition, you know, get, mm -hmm. uh, get them indoctrinated early. 
<laughs> yeah, and then looking at possibly as well, and this may not be so much research focused, but uh, creating a minor on uh, on food and nutrition that where you know there are courses in in sociology uh, that relates to uh, to nutrition and and our relationship with food, so food sociology. So so bring those types of courses and communication as well has a course uh, or courses in health. And, and bring those into a potential minor for students outside of our faculty who may be interested in, in finding more about nutrition. Absolutely, yeah. So maybe the last question, I, oh, I noticed the time is flying, yeah. So um, uh, can you discuss the philosophy of cross-appointment and how uh, may facilitate uh, uh, graduate student uh, supervision? But you know, obviously this is, the students are key to collaboration, right? You know, so. Um, I guess it's related to that as well. Absolutely, and I think we have, uh, so if, if someone's interested in, in becoming affiliated with the faculty, uh, if you let us know, and, and if there's a more like a, a specific school that the person would like to be attached to because of research interest, because of, of compatibility, um, you know, usually it's um, it's done via the school. It's sort of we have a school teaching personnel committee that will look at uh, the potential affiliation and and um, and creating the sort of the collaboration, but putting it into a formal structure where the person is adjunct, let's say for or cross appointed for a period of time, uh, and with the cross appointment usually comes um, uh, privileges. I guess you could say. With respect to uh, to supervision, uh, and so once it goes through the school, then it goes through the faculty teaching personnel committee, and then it gets officialized by the university. And so we have a number of individuals in in that uh, system. And and if if you wanted to contact me directly, uh, you certainly could Lucy at uottawa.ca, and I can certainly facilitate that process because it is uh, uh, Bob. It is important to I, I think for, for people to collaborate and it's a great opportunity to train graduate students and it, it provides them with great opportunities to be exposed to research in the Heart Institute and also research within the faculty. So good question. Yeah, I know uh, this uh, certainly music to our years and uh, we'll be working you know, very closely uh, with you on that. That's fantastic. Um, so just in view of the time, but uh, you, know, you can see how uh, much, uh, you know, sort of uh, uh, attention this uh, does actually attract uh, at the Heart Institute. This is so timely. And uh, so really, you know, thanks uh, uh, to uh, Professor Tax and Professor Garcia, Doyen, uh, Thibault to really come today, you know, bring us up to date uh, in terms of the uh, faculty's strategic, uh, you know, priorities and the exciting things is that's uh, ongoing. So much, uh, you know, natural overlap. And of course we have the richness you know, of real world patients and uh, many of uh, kind of, uh, uh, um, uh, you know, sort of parallel, uh, you know, research domains that really can do uh, with uh, the collaboration, the training uh, uh, opportunities. Yeah, so we uh, really look forward to uh, working uh, with everyone uh, to really make this a reality. And uh, I think it's a win-win for everyone involved. And uh, I know, you know, we have a, a round table that uh, we can actually follow some of this up. And uh, so just on behalf of uh, the entire Heart Institute and the community, uh, thank you for your uh, wonderful um, presentation today and the discussion. And uh, just a, a few uh, logistics. So keep in mind uh, that we do have Easter break for the next week. And, uh, but uh, on April 19th, uh, we have a presentation from Professor Greg uh, Adele Finger, uh, who is actually, uh, the Sheila and Dombing Cardiovascular Genetics and Dow lecturer for this year. And he is at the uh, Hôpital Justine in Montreal. Mm -hmm. And he's an outstanding uh, investigator on functional genomics of congenital heart disease. So we'll be able to follow up on that. So Maxi Boku, thank you so much for joining us. Have a wonderful day. And we look forward to uh, working you know, with our team. Thank you. Take care. Bye.